Welcome, everyone, to the New York City Multifamily Podcast. Joe Kosim and I are joined by Senior Executive Vice President, heading up the Commercial Real Estate Multifamily Lending Department of New York Community Bank, Mr. John Adams. John, thank you very, very much for joining us. We're very honored to have you here. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. Of I'm course, John. To be here. Thank Appreciate you. you being here. Look, there's been a lot happening. I'm going to give you a little, little red meat here. There's been a lot happening in the banking world lately. What are you, what say you? Can you answer that in like one sentence? Yeah, yeah. you know, um, I, I wish I could answer it in one sentence. Yeah. It right now is, uh, it's a bit of a roller coaster. Obviously, I think one of the, you know, post-pandemic pressures other than, you know, office environment is the interest rate environment. You know, I think that really is having a, a major impact on commercial real estate, multifamily, and the housing market. Um, we're fortunate enough to be in New York City where you really can't kill New York City. You just can't. I mean, I've been through many a cycle uh, from 9-11 to the Great Recession. And, and as much as there were some challenges, we've always seemed to find our way through. Um, but that was in a different rate environment. Mm -hmm. And maybe rates were a little bit higher in some of those instances. But when you shoot up 500 basis points in about 12 months' time, um, that really has a real impact when it comes to folks looking to buy properties um, or refinance, or for those borrowers who I'm sure we've all know the same people, um, they have loans that are repricing, mm -hmm. right? And when you underwrote those loans at coupons that were, like I said, 500, 400, 500 basis points less than where they are now at coverage minimums that were always acceptable, well, when you go from a three and a half percent rate to a you know seven seven and a half, it's hard to meet those requirements, especially here in New York. If you were dealing with a rent regulated property that in 2019, as we know, were stymied yeah. with rent regulation law changes. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, okay. So obviously, 2019, everyone's somewhat familiar by now with HS HTSPA, um, and. We wanted to get your thoughts on how the bank has changed in the underwriting and how you're looking at rent regulated buildings moving forward. Okay. Um, our underwriting really hasn't changed all that much okay. because we always were an in place cash flow lender. We didn't lend on the come. Um, I'll tell you our business model before 2019, just like the owner's business model, worked very well together. Uh, when a rent regulated unit vacated, they had vacancy decontrol. So, you know, most of the, the more savvy owners went in and did their renovations, brought it up to market, took it above that $2,700 plus, plus or minus a month rent and got it out of rent regulation. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great thing. So what they did at that point, our average life alone was probably around three years. They would look to recoup some of that equity they put in. They raised their bottom line by raising rents because they got the units back. And we got penalty income. They got to pull money out. It was just a real good business model for them and for us in 2019. But again, we were underwriting only on the in-place income. We weren't forecasting them taking units back and giving them more dollars, assuming they were going to make a change. So at this point, we're still looking at the same in-place income. It's just that we maybe are looking at a little bit tighter with, with cap rate. Um, maybe we take a little bit more um, vacancy and collection. Mm -hmm. uh, because it does happen, uh, especially during the pandemic. You know, there was a lot of leeway given to tenants where they didn't have to pay rent. Uh, and we all know the city of New York in trying to deal with landlord-tenant court, for the most part, it seems to be a bit more tenant-friendly than it is landlord-friendly. We never heard that before. That was very eloquently yeah. said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to remember, you know, my audience. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not messing around, of course. But you, okay, so you've, You've been doing this a while, so you've been here for the good times, the bad times, um, some roller coaster years throughout the economy. How does what we're going through right now compare to different points in history like 2008 and earlier where we had, you know, banking, financial type of issues? Are there any um, sort of similarities or differences or maybe tools at your, disposable, at your disposal that you think you can utilize to kind of weather the storm, so to speak? Great question. Um, I'm going to say the major difference is the fact that there are occupancy issues within the commercial real estate market, not the multifamily. Uh, multifamily, as we've all seen, has done very well. Uh, obviously, at the start of the pandemic, 
you know, some of the buildings we're experiencing as much as 25, 30, maybe even 40 percent vacancy because folks weren't going into the office. Everyone was, I think, a little spooked by the mm -hmm. fact that there was a pandemic going on and uh, the younger folks went back to you know the island or Westchester to be with their parents and living in the basement or well, they just moved out of town in general. They went to other states. But that rebounded so quick. I mean, to the point where you know, 20 percent uh, or higher are some of the rent levels now where they were pre-pandemic on market rents are even higher. So the residential market has withstood the storm. It's, as we all know, the office market and, you know, some of the, the, the retail itself. Um, that, that's where the challenges are. You know, we need to have people back to work. We need to get back into the office. Um, I think it's healthy for uh, the younger working generation. You know, I have uh, three kids myself, all in uh, uh, the business world. They work all for motor. No, they're all back in here in the city. You know, I get uh, I get some some moans and groans yeah. when I when I hear them complaining, but um, especially some of my younger. My, I only have three, but I know like from my my 26 year old and my 22 year old who just got in the work environment. It's good to be around your peers. You know, you learn a lot. Yeah. You, you know how to uh, uh, deal with situations that maybe you wouldn't have been um, exposed to mm -hmm. just by sitting at home. Yeah, you have to yeah. learn the business by other people with other people. Yeah. What a cool talk is it's really real. something that um, you can't really discount as being not important because it is. Mm -hmm. But that said, um, we're not rebounding where we want to be. I think the last I looked at um, uh, the statistics, maybe a little bit more of a 50% swipes back coming into the office. Uh, so that doesn't mean, and one thing, you know, I, I'm talking ahead of what I wanted to say, but we can't measure against 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone says, oh, you know, offices, 40% occupied, 50%, 60%. We were never 100, right? right? We were always in that, 85, 90. So that's really what we should be comparing it to. You know, for the deals that we've done over the years um, in the office market, I don't think we were ever really much above 90, 95% occupancy at any one time. And again, if you looked at the statistics, depending on the neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, it was probably closer to 85, 88, and 90%. So that's really what I think everyone should measure against and not think, oh, 100%. Yeah. No one's ever at 100%. Yeah, because the data could be just mis a little misleading, right, Correct. if you're just looking at the headlines. Correct. So that's actually a really good point. Mm -hmm. How have you guys um, changed what you're lending on necessarily where um, we were talking to an insurance broker the other day, and he was talking about how the insurance market is completely changing and how their underwriting policies are changing depending on what the product is, what it's made out of, where it's located. I think it was State Farm that completely pulled out of the California. entire state of California, which I think is really interesting. And they just pulled out of Florida. And yeah. they just pulled out of Florida. So they're basically selecting um, their risk profiles. And I would ask you kind of the same question, right? Like you, t you mentioned that you're always lending on cash flow, so you kind of have some built-in cushion there. But how have you guys... Is there any uh, similar practices that you guys are imploring as it sure. kind of relates to that? Uh, that's another great question because obviously income is income. You know, you can match it to a lease, to a certified rent roll, and assuming that there's no fraudulent activity and what's being submitted on that end. But expenses are always the where you have a little bit of room to be more logical and realistic. And when you're looking at historical expenses, especially when it comes to insurance and taxes, you can't really gauge them as being that's what it's going to be this year and going forward. So where we get stung a lot of times um, in quoting a deal and taking a check and getting the process mm -hmm. going is when the appraisal comes back and their comps for insurance and taxes are higher, even though maybe what's currently in place is not, but we know when that premium comes due, it's gonna roll. So we've been asking in some instances, give me something from your broker showing me what the new bill is going to be so we right. can factor that in. So we're trying to forecast uh, looking ahead on where we're going to be. Uh, we're doing, you know, we do a fair amount because we have a presence in Florida. We do a sure. fair amount in Florida, mainly multi the multifamily. Uh, but that insurance market, I mean, I own property in Florida. It's just crazy. Yeah. So it's rather than trying to guess, yeah. we want to get your policy premium receipt on a go forward basis. So right, but but they're only locking in. These are like one or two year deals, which yeah. is kind of interesting because you historically said you're in and out of the deal in three years, yeah. right? On average. But now you're loaning like your typical loan is right, five, seven or ten year term. And 
maybe the business model in New York has changed where you can't get in and out of a deal in three years unless the political winds change. So a lot of people that we're talking, right, Joe, you and I, how most of the time, a lot of people that are buying right now are talking about buying something for the long term. Yeah, the right. in and out so, in New York, it doesn't exist anymore. So the way right, people like, made money in New York has been, you know, long-term generational wealth and the business plans have changed and the level of diligence that you, the bank are doing and the bar are doing is different. And that's been a big change in the, the, the actual underwriting. I think it's like, it's an interesting perspective, maybe from the bank's view that I've never thought yeah. of where you're looking at the deal, right? You're saying, okay, I'm giving you a 10 year loan. So I'm planning on being in the deal for 10 years, I would assume if you're given the money, but you, it's hard to forecast insurance and taxes, et cetera. How do you, I mean, what do you say to like, how do you kind of cushion yourself? Well, less dollars, higher coverage. You know, you got, I'll tell you, that's one avenue that saved us from having, and again, we don't have a large office portfolio. I was going to ask you what percentage. Uh, a few, a few yeah, billion. Okay. okay. And mainly Midtown. Yeah. Uh, we have some suburban office, but and the the main uh, uh, concentration is here in Manhattan. But we always were conservative. We were always no more than 65 percent, uh, 130 to 140 coverage. So we kind of had a built-in cushion mm -hmm. um, for something like a pandemic that we never envisioned a pandemic. So we had a little bit of wiggle room in there to um, deal with higher vacancies, uh, slow-paying tenants. So that did help. And I'll, I'll tell you, knock on wood, uh, we really have experienced very little disruption. We've had some people making some calls saying, I think I need a little bit of uh, guidance, uh, a little bit of assistance, but you know, no one has mailed the keys back yet. Okay. Uh, so we've been very lucky. Uh, very maybe they don't have banks. your address. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I got to keep moving. <laughs> um, I'll keep changing the name. <laughs> yeah, that has helped. That has helped. That so let's talk helped. about the merger for sure, a minute. Sure, so, sure. so you recently acquired Flagstar. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about how that's impacted your business, where it's going to help you the most, where the what are the advantages of the acquisition? Sure. So um, I'm sure everyone who is familiar with the New York market, New York Community Bank, um, you know, we were, um, we still are the um, leading portfolio lender in New York City yep. for rent regulated non luxury apartment buildings. And I think right behind us was Signature. Is that a good thing? Or, uh, yeah, you know what? It used to be a great thing. Yeah. Um, not that it's a bad thing because I think we've always picked the right pony, you know, the right, the right sponsor. Um, our credit quality has always stood up to all the cycles. Um, that's one thing that the regulators who we've uh, uh, dealt with over the years have, uh, even though they try to find uh, a crack in the armor, um, they can't really criticize the credit quality. Right. So we've always stood on our platform that you know we are you know credit solid, and we have been. Um, but in 2019, and, and just before 2000, before 2019. You know, rent regulated multifamily buildings or non rent regulated buildings, that's that's what made us who we are. We were good at it. We are good at it. But then 2019, when the rent regulation law changed, it kind of did slow up our business model. Uh, we were still doing refinances, but then a lot of our relationships, uh, I think we were talking about before we started the, the show, um, they started finding other opportunities outside of New York. So, what better? way to continue to grow your business, follow your relationships. And we followed the relationships that we felt good about. And we went up and down the East Coast. We went to you know, the Sun Belt states. Um, you know, we always had since 2009, the opportunity to lend more in Florida, Arizona, Ohio, because we had branch locations and we had a presence there. Mm -hmm. So it made it, uh, it gave us more opportunity. But we went into states that we really didn't have a lot of experience in. So we trusted our borrowers, our sponsors, because um, they were all buying properties. So it's not like they were refinancing stuff that they've owned and pulling cash out. There was cash equity going in ahead of us on average 25, 30%. So that was you know, a good starting point, knowing that the cash was going in ahead of me. And they did their homework. Yeah, did and their your homework. timing sounded like it was good, right? Timing was really Rent good. growth. Really, really happened. good. Couldn't yeah. happen at a better right. time because right. then the pandemic came and um, they all, all the people who fled, you know, the blue states, mm -hmm. you know, uh, going to uh, more 
uh, capitalistic friendly areas, they really um, did well. And they did their due diligence on rent growth and what they could get doing turns and, and when vacancies came up. But we did our own as well. I mean, we didn't just rely on them. You know, we followed the MSA. You know, we wanted to know what was going on in the area. What, are, what were vacancies like? Where do people go to work? Uh, what are the, what's, what's the healthcare system? So we did all that. And we do not close a loan, like I don't think most lenders do, without going and kicking the tires. You know, and people would say, John used to go out and, and look at properties. Yeah, I do. Um, number one, I enjoy it. I enjoy learning about the different markets and what's going on. And I love talking to people. Um, and you get a property manager or an agent who doesn't really know really how to handle the conversation. And you throw questions at them and they just open up, you know, and things that you may not have known, you find out. Uh, but that's far and few between where you really find an, an issue. But that really did help us continue with our business model growth by following the relationships, who we trusted, who we had a good track record with outside of our normal lending area. And now we have a presence. We did, you know, probably a few billion dollars um, in a 18, 24 months time of new growth oh, just wow. by following, you know, relationships outside of the market. You were probably competing with the agencies and other Always compete lenders, with the agencies. Right. Which is not typical in New York, right? No. No. So how was that a, a change for you and how do you guys overcome that? Yeah, so right now, um, if you look at today, yeah. um, if I'm you know losing a deal in the portfolio, if it's not for one of my smaller portfolio competitors, um, it was agency. And again, they were the smaller deals, not that they're bad deals. I think the smaller deals is what helped build us who we are. Uh, but now since the Flagstar transaction, I know that's where we started sure. this, this part of the topic. Um, we're looking to become more of a real commercial bank, a uh, national presence. We want the relationship, uh, making the loan and taking an operating account worked for so many years, but now we want to focus more on relationship lending and commercial bank products. Um, and now with the Flagstar transaction, um, it does offer some more diversity. You know, we were kind of like a one trick pony yeah. uh, and it was fine until it wasn't really fine anymore. Yeah. So Flagstar offers different business lines uh, that complemented us. Um, it wasn't really an overlap, uh, a commercial, uh, a commercial lines of credit, um, as well as uh, I think we're number six in the one to four family uh, market. You know, do a lot of uh, servicing as well as originating, selling to the secondary market. Mm -hmm. That was a you know a, a, a huge platform and a huge money maker for them. You know, until obviously rates went up and things slowed sure. down, but that's just temporary. It will come back, and and we do service uh, uh, billions for others as well. Um, and is that part of the reason why you acquired the signature private banking business for the relationships and to carry that forward? Yeah, that's uh, that was part of it yeah. um, because we do want to we do want the wealth business, we do want the healthcare business, um, but Signature, as we know, um, had a real successful business model of gathering deposits. Uh, their their uh, private banking clients and private banking groups um, did a real good job. And when w the bank runs happened in February and March, um, they unfortunately uh, were, were, were subject to that. And it wasn't their lending. It wasn't their loans. It was what they had in deposits that were, you know, uninsured. You know, anything over the $250,000. And when people panicked that uh, when Silicon Valley and uh, I think there was another one, um, were having this run, they had deposits tied to crypto. And though they didn't lend on crypto, they had the businesses accounts. Interest rates started going up. That market slowed down. People started pulling the money out. And then there was an overall, I guess, panic. Yeah. And people who didn't even have crypto related deposits right. started pulling money out. And that's really, I think, uh, unfortunately for that. And, and Signature uh, was a friend. Yeah. They are a friend and they were, they were friendly competition. Yeah. So um, if, if that had to happen, I'm just glad that we were there to pick up some of the pieces and uh, bring, on, bring on board um, good people yeah. uh, in our backyard. Uh, relationships that that we know. Uh, you know, I knew that team very well. I saw them at you know, every local yes. event uh, and out of state events. Um, so we were fortunate to have that. But what that did for us, it really strengthened our balance sheet and our liquidity ratios even more so. 
And just keep in mind, we just had closed on December 1st um, a transaction that we didn't fully integrate yet. I mean, we're, you know, we still have system integrations to do. And the regulators agreed and assisted in allowing us to be the successful bidder. Now, they didn't, I'm sure what we've offered, they had to accept that this it wasn't because they just liked us, but they knew that it was a good fit. Um, Tom Kajemi, our CEO, did a real good job in speaking with them and giving them the, the confidence that we were the right person to take the assets and deposits that we wanted. Yeah, it seemed like it happened really quickly. Do you think there were a lot of other Two days. Um, Did, was, well, was, was that, anyone was else at, wow. at the party there? Yeah. Or was it kind of just There like were other a, people. There were other people. And obviously, they don't really disclose that. Of course. Um, there were other people. But I think there was some concern that um, whoever was going to buy it, they were buying also uh, a real estate book of business. Mm -hmm. And unless you are experienced, especially in the New York City market, and most of what they had in their portfolio was the New York City real estate market, whether it be multifamily office or rent regulated properties. It still was a you know a, a big chunk. I was surprised at how big of the book is actually commercial office properties because Signature was obviously known just like you guys as multifamily lenders, but I think it's about 17 billion. Uh, it was, it yeah. was about that, and because that still hasn't traded, right? So no, it yeah. hasn't traded, and I I'm, I'm, I speculate that it'll probably be broken up into tranches. That's what yeah. we're hearing. Yeah. Now. yeah, I think the CRE and multi uh, the CRE and office will be, you know, in one tranche, and maybe market rent multifamily being another, and rent regulated another. But I will say that I'm sure there's a lot of sensitivity around who buys the multifamily, especially the rent regulated. Mm -hmm. Because as, as you know, affordable housing here in the city is uh, a real uh, protected yeah. class. Yeah. So what, is that, what does that look like? What's, what's going to happen? Let's go to Fantasyland yeah. here. What's going to happen? Yeah, we, we want to hear your predictions. Did you pass on it so you can now come back and get it for cheaper? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want no, you know what? Through? Because we don't want to end up shooting ourselves in the foot either, right? I mean, we have good customers, good borrowers, good relationships that we've had for decades. And I think we'd just be, you know, um, doing ourselves dis disservice if we go and try to buy something for however many pennies on the dollar um, compared to maybe someone who's got in the same situation. They'll be coming to me saying, hey, Adams, uh, uh, let, let me have a break. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't really want to double down. Our book is, you know. A, you have a sizable book in the re regulated world. Right. So right. why would we need to really double down on what we have already? Um, from a concentration standpoint, not only for property type, but relationships. Uh, we have a lot of uh, folks who we both dealt with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they had 50% with Signature, 50% with us, or, or vice versa. One way, or the, one way or another, it just didn't make sense. I will tell you that, um, and, and it's not a secret, if there is something in that portfolio and it's a good relationship that we now have on our books with uh, deposits that come along with it, We'll look at that, uh, but this has going to have to be underwritten so, on our standards. So let's talk about that for a minute, because Signature was known for bringing in deposits and being creative and flexible with their borrowers. How are you guys going to continue that trend to keep the deposits at the bank and being able to continue servicing those type of clients? We will look at every request yeah. that, that comes in. I'm prepared for that. My team is prepared for that. Yeah but we can't jump through hoops and get things done that we normally wouldn't have done before Signature. Right, so your fundamentals of how you run the business is gonna continue. It's gonna continue. And obviously with the different, yeah. yeah. Now, does that mean we won't uh, maybe consider a little bit higher loan to value as long as we have the coverage on something that we maybe would have uh, originally offered a few less dollars on? Depends on who, what, where, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Relationships really are key today in banking. The the banking market specifically in New York seems kind of like ripe for disruption where there's a lot of uncertainty, right? We talk mm -hmm. about new buyers coming to the market and just like you kind of got to have like the guts to go do a deal. I'm curious if you have an opinion on um, maybe there's some new lenders that would come enter the market, right? To try to fill the signature void. You guys obviously have a significant amount of exposure here. Is there any sort of words of wisdom that you would say to a new lender entering the market you've been here a long time cautionary tales eyes yeah. wide open anything you think you would be willing to share uh where's the wisdom um don't do it <laughs> no just play just, powerable <laughs> um, <laughs> um 
you know, because there are still lenders, you know. Of there, course, there's a lot of alternative lenders. There are, you know, there, there's fairly new, newer lenders in this market that haven't left that we've uh, uh, ran up alongside of in deals along the years um, that I think still want the opportunity. They're still going to underwrite like um, most of us do. You know, they're going to err on the side of caution. Remember, we're rent, reg oh, rent regulated. We are regulated. So um, we always have people, and when I say us, banks, always have someone looking over our shoulder. So you can't get too aggressive without being challenged. I think, you know, if you are um, uh, an insurance company um, or a private, a private equity fund that wants to do some lending, um, those are probably the players who can probably do a more good service to the landlord or the buyer yeah. than a bank just, beca just because. We're right. seeing a lot of those players now going the other way and losing some of the assets that they... Yeah, right. well, yeah, uh, they also were aggressive at Correct. the Correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah, these are those rising market, right? Right, they started out on the, on the equity side looking to buy deals and now the returns aren't necessarily mm -hmm. there. Um, and now they're trying to put money out in the form of debt, because everyone's saying, oh, debt's at 7%, where I can't buy a deal at a seven cap, so why don't I lend at a seven cap? And um, all, our, all our clients are turning into lenders. Yeah, right? all of a sudden, everyone's and, a lender. Yeah. And, and I wonder what's happening with the preferred equities and the MES lenders right before everything, right before the music stopped and yeah. they took a chair away. You never really played in that space. No, listen, yeah. we've, uh, uh, we never were a, a MES lender. Yeah. Um, did we permit it on some transactions? Sure, sure. if it made sense. Uh, it had to be, for the most part, an acquisition, it's where there was equity going in on the sponsor side, mm -hmm. um, and it just we just needed to understand the transaction. We tried to only allow it with uh, um, secondary lenders, mes lenders, who we had comfort with. Mm -hmm. We tried not to go uh, with someone who we really don't know how they operate. How are they going to handle um, a default? Are they going to be looking to default the owner? Um, so, you know, we had to take all those factors into account before we permitted it. But in answer to your question, you know, we, we didn't plan it. We, and we were very select for those who we did allow to go behind us. Right. And again, our position doesn't change. It's they could just end up being the one who was in, in the driver's seat and running the property. Right? Yeah. Do you think there's going to be more bank takeovers in the coming months and are you guys sort of have your eyes open for those type of opportunities um yes i believe that there will be more um i think with this credit cycle going on right now i mean capital is not cheap mm -hmm. um and in order for banks if they don't have a lot of diversification in in their lending products where they can you know lend you know in, in shorter term floating rate uh, vehicles, then yeah, those those folks are going to have a capital issue, and I think they're going to have some some credit issues. I'm not saying that they were bad underwriters, but I think the smaller shops are going to be um, challenged, and I think there will be some uh, acquisitions or bank failures. Will we be there? I think we'll always be there for the right opportunity. Um, we do want to get through what we just. Yeah, you, <laughs> you have a lot to do. You took a big yeah. bite out yeah. of the market. Yeah, you know, we had integration and systems that yeah. we still need to work through, and and I think some of the executive team would probably uh, uh, would want to make sure the windows didn't open if we did another deal because yeah. it would be like, wow, that's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. far as far as lending right now, there was a point in time where some of these banks pulled back and said only existing borrowers. Where do you stand? Are you are you lending to? Not anyone, but are you lending to new borrowers right now? And are you what kind of new capital are, are you personally seeing? Because us on the investment sales side, we're seeing a lot of new capital flow in from, you know, foreign capital, new buyers just coming in that sold out of state that are coming to New York because there's a huge opportunity here to now to buy five and a half, six caps on multifamily, uh, which you you know weren't able to see for a long time. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on who the new borrowers are and how you're looking at them. You know, uh, the old way was, yeah, I, I would look at it as long as they had, a, you know, a resume that uh, seemed to fit uh, how we look at, you know, the type of sponsor we want in our portfolio. Sure. Today, um, the same requirements, however, like I said earlier, we want the relationship. Yeah. Um, what can you bring to me in addition to, you know, an operating account? Uh, because we could be more aggressive with the more deposits we have. Um, if you have to borrow, you know, I, I think people 
uh, or a lot of borrowers, whether it be you know commercial real estate or otherwise, think that banks just have a, a big vault with money in there, and every time they close a loan, they just take money out of the vault. That's um, not how it works. And that's not how it works. <laughs> um, we have to borrow money too. Oh, yeah. oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, it's just like all these syndicators. Everyone's getting the money from someone else. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's where you have the federal home loan bank, right. and you know, and and but the cost to borrow is up. The cost of capital yeah. is very expensive. Yeah. So you ask why are the rates seven, seven and a half, whatever it is. Well, because I need to make you know a spread on it too. Are they coming yeah. down soon? Uh, I sure as heck hope so. We're forecasting, you know, you know everything you're reading here. Um, hopefully the first half of 2024, we're going to see some, some downward movement. Uh, the road ahead is going to be bumpy, yeah. uh, for at least another nine to 12 months, in my opinion. Uh, and I just think that we all need to be prepared for that. Uh, I think if we see some more rebounding in the office market, hopefully that will, you know, improve things somewhat, but there's still going to be some challenges ahead. And I think we're in a real good position. You know, we went from uh, on November 30th being a $60 billion company to being a $120 billion company oh, as wow. we sit here today. Wow. So besides the increase in revenue, Our assets, what else in yeah. assets, what else has uh, NYCB slash Flagstar prepared, in, you know, in the up, for the upcoming nine months, 12 yeah. months, like you said? Uh, well, again, we do have a lot of short-term product that's out there that floats, so... Um, we are getting, I think, the the margin that we would need to make it make sense. Uh, but we're probably at a size right now and and a, a performing portfolio across all verticals of business that if we didn't lend another penny for another six nine months, we'd be fine. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So good. let's okay, because we're gonna wrap up in a few minutes. But there's there's one thing that I think would be really helpful. To, a lot of the listeners that are going to listen to this are going to be your borrowers who don't necessarily have your direct phone number or can't, you know, get someone on the line with decision making capabilities. Uh, if someone had a loan at 3%, right, that's coming due over the next 12, 24 months, whatever it is, and the values are down, and maybe there's a big rent stabilized component to it. Um, what do you think they should do in terms of like, being proactive? Should they reach out to you guys? Like, Maybe some of these people are having a hard time even servicing their three and four percent debt, and now they're going to have to go refi at six percent. Mm-hmm. So what what do you think? You know, pretend that we're talking to the borrower. And maybe what you're already seeing. I mean, I'm sure yeah, you're uh, having these conversations. We're yeah. seeing it already. Um, I guess one of the uh, benefits of uh, having a loan with us on a multifamily series uh, was the fact that even though it was maybe a five year fixed rate deal was actually a 10-year deal fixed for five. Right. So you had an automatic reprice. Uh, and what we've um, offered to those folks, um, I think we started that in the beginning of the third quarter of last year, uh, we gave you another option because the options that they currently had really weren't market-friendly by way of terms, and they weren't meant to be. They were meant to uh, make you want to come back and refinance with us. So uh, we offered another option tied to sulfur. Uh, which yeah is not going to be three three and a half percent, but some of the options that optionality that was built into the documents was higher than that, um, and that has really been a lifeline to many of them uh, because, like I said, picking the right pony, the right horse to ride on, if you did the the larger the sponsorship with the more properties and the more cash flow, maybe property A isn't performing the way that you had hoped it would, but property B's got excess so. Um, we've been very fortunate to have those type of relationships where um, they can weather another three, 400 basis points. Right. Uh, and hopefully in the short term, when I say short term, 12, 18 months, we'll start seeing the settling and they can you know, focus on doing a more uh, normalized refinance to a, to a fixed rate product. Yeah, we, um, you know, to, to, help, uh, to help learn, right? Like everyone kind of looks, you turn on the TV or social media or whatever it is, and you hear some talking head giving an opinion, and that's maybe someone that I would look up to or whoever it is. You know, who do you look up to? Yeah. Like who, who do you view as credible and like who do you, whose opinion do you take? Yeah, like I said, I was, uh, before I came in here and sat with you, I was listening to your CEO on, up on the television and he was giving his- uh, He's uh, impressive. Uh, state of the union on the commercial real estate market. And he seemed optimistic. I mean, he wasn't. We're brokers. We got to sell buildings. Yeah, I know. I know. You need to put out <laughs> <I'm> money. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I just listen to everyone. I really do. I listen to everyone. Uh, I read a lot of the periodicals. Um, do I listen to the regulatory agencies as much? I think they're sometimes more on the uh, on the conservative side in, in their thought process. I try to talk to the owners. Um, and, and it's funny, uh, owners who I've spoken with uh, over the course of the past year, as much as you think they all think the same, they don't. Mm. You know, there's different takes. Different so, angles. Yeah, different angles. You know, yeah. some say office is dead. Yeah. Um, others say that it will come back. Um, it won't come back to the way it was. Yeah. Uh, like I, again, um, uh, your CEO was saying that some of the reuse of office, especially in like the, the C-class buildings, probably more in the garment district, um, they may not come back, but take the land underneath them. You know, that's worth something. Yeah. And if the city is, uh, uh, serious, which I know they are about providing affordable housing, uh, Governor Hochul, bring back the 421A. You know, yeah. And, 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 yeah. Do you, I mean... A lot of like the landlord industry, you know, Chip and RSA has been very proactive among in like the political world. Do you guys do any sort of outreach? Because you guys are putting up 75% of the money, yeah. like when these buildings are purchased. What sort of? We're a regulated institution, so we have to be really um, cognizant of that. Yeah. Um, we don't want to, you know, cross anyone the wrong way. Yeah, totally. Uh, but we understand uh, the chips of the world. Um, you know, there are banks that have lobbyists that they retain to speak on behalf because, you know, and as much as we want to protect the housing uh, um, supply of affordable units, you want to protect the banks too. Yeah. Uh, because who's making the CRE and real estate loans? It's it's the regional banks. Um, it's not, it's not really, I mean, Chase has got a small lending program, yeah. but I don't think Bank of America does. I don't think Wells does. Uh, the uh, PNCs. So they have to protect the banks. Yeah. Well, that's so. why I like this whole signature, you know, portfolio sale is going to be very interesting in the next couple of months because the FDIC is probably very cognizant of this and how they, you know, execute this transaction is going to be. 100%. Yeah. We're, we're monitoring it very yeah, closely. Yeah, I, I would imagine because the signature wasn't the only one in this situation. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be headline news. Yeah. All right, last fun question. Yeah. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Hmm. Well, could be a client. Could be. It could be mm -hmm. Joe, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just had some <laughs> some, some, <laughs> some some pigs in the blanket. Yeah, we had exactly. a couple. Joe, what about? <laughs> all right, let's get. No, let's no, give, let's no, give no, him a no, second no, to no. think. No, 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 no. I, I want you to answer this. You want me? You always, okay. You always ask. Okay, I I would love you to. And you got to be switching now. I'm gonna uh, Jay Powell because I actually really want to know. You know, he keeps saying two percent, two percent, two percent. There are some real consequences to getting to 2%. And I was reading um, a couple of months ago that I think it wasn't until the Greenspan era that there was no specific number of a targeted inflation. And somebody said, once you put a number on it, there's going to be consequences. I don't know what the consequences will be, but now we ha we're running around with 7% debt all because someone decided that 2% is the right number for inflation. So I'd like to really kind of yeah, get in there with him. I don't know. Like that's, the, the that's Fed, just me. The, the Fed chairman, I don't know how much I, um, uh, how much weight I put into, yeah. cause I didn't, who knows what goes on behind those scenes, yeah. but maybe like a Warren Buffett, you know, someone yeah, who yeah. is, you know, well-versed in real estate and other investments. Um, I think, you know, sad, sitting down and, 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 and grabbing a bite to eat with someone like him, I think could be very informative just to see how the mind works. Um, obviously, he's done something right. Yeah, I think I heard he still goes to like the McDonald's drive through I, yeah, I, Maybe I that's where you guys will go together. <laughs> hey, there's nothing the wrong with Big Mac. Yeah, jo Joey, dinner. Uh, you know, speaking of how the mind works, I mean, Elon Musk would be pretty interesting. Yeah. To that's a good one. one. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah so, I'd like that one. I yeah. would. That's, that I, yeah. Maybe we'd have, he would might even all take right, We'll get them all together. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a double do date. Double you know? date. <laughs> I don't all know right. if Elon will eat at McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> but um, John, thank you very, very much for joining us. We really appreciate your time and your insight. It's been really thank fun you. getting to know you. Appreciate and, it. And talk about yeah. all this thank, stuff. Had a great time. Thank you for coming. I know we have a lot of mutual friends and clients, and it was really nice sitting down with you. Great. Thanks. thanks for sharing your insights. My pleasure. Have thanks, a great John. day. Thanks. We'll see you soon.